Good afternoon. We'd like to start the program. Uh, we want to be very respectful of everybody's time who is also Zooming in and participating, as well as those of you who are in attendance here today. So thank you very much. I'm Dan Buttry, President and CEO of the War Memorial Center. I just want to give a little housekeeping and then I'll hand it over to the, uh, to the team. Um, first off, restrooms are on this level, right out the door, and then fourth floor right above us. Um, the, uh, today's program was pulled together rather quickly, as you know, over the last few weeks. Uh, Mike Orban, um, who's up here, a Vietnam veteran and part of an uh, incredible team of mental health experts, uh, as well as Aurora and the VA, were reaching out saying, we're hearing a lot, we're hearing a lot out there in the marketplace, and a lot of veterans are calling, um, we should, we should, we've got to do something. Well, last Monday and today, that's our something. Um, it's, it's, you'll see it's very, it's designed to, to give um, ideas, recommendations, uh, ways forward. And I think you'll find that the team that we've assembled today for this presentation, they're, they're quite powerful individuals and, and have got a lot to share. Um, the War Memorial Center is preparing to do a series of 9-11 recognition events starting next week. Um, you'll note on the table as you come in, there's a series of activities that are set up. I do want to call this one out. I really, really encourage everybody, this is something you can do today. Never forget the 9-11 Remembrance Wall. We're establishing a, an exhibit downstairs in Freedom Gallery. So if you came in off the North parking lot, and this will be a wall where your handwritten notes of I remember 9-11 uh, will go on that wall. It'll be a very powerful reminder. And then that will be on display for a series of, um, well, through the end of the year. So I'd like to encourage you to do that. Also, um, this is something you can do now, is we've identified five locations across the state where you can go and visit and see sections of the I-beam um, areas, uh, Nielsville, where you've got the high ground, because uh, you can do this over time and reflection. And next week, Thursday, Dr. Kalinda, Colonel, uh, retired, he'll be doing a special presentation here. Um, he worked as a combat commander, as a colonel, as well as under the um, directive of two secretary of defenses in Afghanistan, working directly with the Taliban. Um, we had this conversation with Chris about six months ago, uh, but obviously it's rather timely. And that will be uh, Thursday of next week going into 9-11. And it's a uh, pretty powerful. And the topic of that is what went right what went wrong and what America should do next. So I encourage you to, uh, to join us over the next few weeks and uh, participate in that. So uh, we'd like to start and I'll bring up um, Sam Rogers. If you could come up, he'll be emceeing this event, uh, multi-tour Afghanistan veteran and uh, Sam, it's a pleasure, thank you. Uh, first, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this is incredibly important. This event's called uh, We Grieve Together. It's a conversation about Afghanistan, but it's not something that's just limited to Afghanistan, obviously. Uh, thanks to the uh, Mike Orban Foundation for, uh, for Veterans uh, for putting this together. Uh, you'll see around the room there are uh, peer support uh, folks wearing big yellow name tapes. Um, if anyone needs to speak with anyone, just look for your nearest smiling face with a big yellow name tape. There's one right there. Good looking gentleman in the jacket. And we want to have a conversation about the path to grief, processing grief, and healing. Um, there are a lot of organizations here, Healing Warrior Hearts, Advocate Aurora, uh, Veterans Program, Milwaukee VA Mental Health Division, and the John D. Mason uh, uh, peer support group with the Medical College of Wisconsin. There are a lot of organizations who are invested in supporting us throughout this journey, uh, us being the veteran community. There's not a manual for grief, for processing um, the pain we feel uh, in different times and places and when different events happen, whether we're there personally or we see them on TV places we've been, places our friends and family members have been. And that can be challenging for folks in a community that uh, can learn anything, how to do anything uh, with a dash 10 manual and an eighth grade reading level. I learned the night before a big mission how to operate a minesweeper. 
And uh, for someone who's pretty tech illiterate, that was, it was a really nice thing to have, that I could just read this, this little easy manual and, and I could successfully find bombs in the ground uh, to avoid stepping on them. That doesn't exist for what we're talking about today. And that's why it's so important that we have this conversation. It's why it's so important that our brothers and sisters uh, of past wars and military generations are here because reinventing the wheel is hard. And a lot of folks here have a lot of different pieces to this puzzle. Um, I wanna introduce our, our panel real quick and, uh, and, and go from there. Uh, Dr. Shelly Amon uh, up on the wall here um, is a Milwaukee native, a board certified uh, psychiatrist and assistant professor to the Yale School of Medicine and VA Healthcare System in West Haven, Connecticut. She focuses on healing PTSD and moral injury, particularly in combat veterans. Um, Dr. Eric Roosh um, is a current serving member of the United States Army and has been in since 2007. Um, he's served in a variety of, uh, of positions as a Army officer, now serves as a psychologist in the Combat Operational Stress Control Unit. In his position at Advocate Aurora, Dr. Roosh uh, focuses on treating trauma, moral injury, working with the military population. Dr. Orban uh, is a U.S. Army Vietnam combat veteran and is a passionate advocate of destigmatizing mental and emotional health issues in the veteran community. Uh, is Dr. Burke on? Oh, there we go. Dr. Burke uh, is a uh, United States uh, Marine Corps veteran, an Iraq combat veteran, and uh, serves as, a, uh, as, the, as the, one of the founding members of um, the uh, veterans, uh, veterans Mental Health Clinic uh, at Aurora and works with the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, and uh, last but absolutely not least, uh, Jason Church, uh, Captain, retired, a fellow 2nd Infantry Division brother, uh, Afghanistan combat veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and a tireless advocate for combat wounded uh, veterans, veterans health care, um, and in particular our uh, allies in Afghanistan who we've been trying to bring, bring home. Thank you all so much for being here, and we're going to start with a presentation by, uh, by Dr. Roosh. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Appreciate everyone being here. Thank you to all the organizations that uh, got this event put together, Dan Butchery, the War Memorial staff, all the organizations that are offering support. Also inviting uh, importance of us being here. You know, the, the whole title of this is healing together, we grieve together. We can't grieve together if nobody shows up. And especially I'd like to thank those who participated last week and brought in some raw emotion um, you can't heal without having it be a little messy. And today what we're talking about is that follow-on conversation. So we gather here today. That's a phrase we use a lot in our culture. Sometimes weddings, baptisms, funerals, memorials. What are we gathered here today to do? We could look around and yell at each other. We could try to war game and figure out what to do next. But this event was designed for us to gather to heal in a safe place with our brothers and sisters. So when I was asked to do this event, I immediately thought of it like a funeral. We're in a room gathered together, but this is an interesting kind of grief because we're not out of this situation yet. It's very similar to having somebody who has a chronic illness was suffering for about 20 years, and then it took a sudden turn for the worse. They're still alive. We have seemingly some control because we're still in the conflict, but we feel very helpless. So how can we even start healing when it's not completely over? It is hard, which is why I think we came here and we're trying to get some guidance. So a little bit about our expectations for today's event. Like I mentioned before, we're not here to solve world issues. That is important, but that's not what we're here for today. You don't go to a funeral to bring back the dead. We're here to heal, specifically together. So myself, the panelists, the peer supports, we're all here to help guide in the hurting and healing process. So how do we typically heal in the veteran culture? It usually starts with anger. 
That's what we're pretty much professionals at. But the problem with grief is there's a lot of emotions tied to it. Anger, guilt, sadness, fear, maybe loneliness, sometimes even relief that it's finally over and there's less dread, maybe acceptance and moving forward. The problem is most vets have been trained to specifically feel anger, suppress everything else and turn it into anger. I think we saw a little bit about that last week and what we're all feeling. Anger for us is like a hammer. It's a tool we use for damn near every job. Some examples, you know, your partner left you while you're serving. You might be feeling lonely, guilty, or sad. Turn that into anger and train harder. Your buddy died. You might be feeling sad. Turn that into anger and volunteer for another deployment. You're getting shot at. Your fight or flight response is activated. You're probably feeling fear. Feeling fear will get you killed. Turn that into anger. Charge the next hill. Go into the next building. Bottom line, we've been trained since boot camp to turn other emotions into anger, into our mighty hammer. The problem is that grieving requires many tools, not just your hammer. Winning wars requires a lot of fucking hammers. The goal here is to not take away your hammer, but add more tools to complement your hammer. Different tools are needed for different jobs. We weren't really trained for this. So let me first start by validating our anger. Your anger is real. It's strong. Many of us are angry. I'm angry. I'm angry at terrorist organizations. I'm angry at feeling lied to at times for 20 years. I'm angry for my brothers and sisters who fought in this conflict, and especially for those who died. I feel the anger in my body. I feel it in my face, tension in my fist and neck urges to yell, to fight, and demand solutions. My anger is real, it is valid, and it is also not the only emotion I'm feeling. I'm also sad, I'm worried, I'm guilty about not serving in Afghanistan. I'm hoping we can get through this. Emotions are data, it's a language many of us weren't taught. It provides valuable information to ourselves and other people. It's a tool that's helpful for things like grieving. So what other tools are in your toolbox right now? They're needed for this process and moving forward. So some other tools that might be in your toolbox, sadness. What might be saddening you right now? What have you lost over the past several weeks? Maybe people to death a part of ourselves, maybe our sense of purpose, maybe our faith in other people? Are you feeling fear? We often feel more fear than we like to admit as veterans. What might we be fearing right now? The lives of Americans or allies? The fear of living a pointless or meaningless life? The fear of an attack, especially with Afghan refugees potentially coming to Wisconsin? Fear of being judged by others about our contributions. Maybe the fear of committing to other causes because those might turn out poorly as well. Reminds me of the quote, it is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Loss challenges that quote. When people feel a lot of loss, they sometimes stop looking for new loves. We might be feeling guilt that we didn't do enough. We should have done more a pit of your gut feeling that could lead to shame-based statements like I'm worthless or I'm not good enough. We might be feeling lonely, especially after expressing anger and pushing other people away. Might have the urge to isolate, a sense of emptiness. We often have strong urges to comfort loneliness in the forms of alcohol, food, drugs, sex, and other means. Being a part of this event today is meant to reduce loneliness too. We might be feeling helpless, which is often immediately followed by anger, especially for our vets due to our training. Helpless, similar to feeling defeated, like your hands are tied, a vulnerable feeling. This is where we often say, fuck it. Relief, some of us may be feeling some relief, knowing something like this was gonna happen eventually, and now it finally has, feeling less dread. 
And some of us may be feeling acceptance, looking at things with a different perspective, letting go of pain that was once held onto, moving forward with a new purpose, a mission or objective, making new connections. These emotions are all normal, whether intense or subtle, present or absent, there is no correct or wrong way to feel. So at this time, I just wanna take a moment of silence for us as a united group to just allow each one of us to feel a little bit of what there is to be felt. Thank you. Now I wanna talk a little bit about boundaries, our left and right limits. If you've ever been on a range, don't shoot left, don't shoot right, don't shoot the animals. As a psychologist, I help people heal emotional wounds. In order to do that, people need to feel safe. I do that by maintaining boundaries, a start and end time, office space with privacy, maybe some structure to the session. Today, we also need structure and boundaries to help us feel less threatened and allow us to use all our tools. So we've got three boundaries for us. Number one, respect. It's an army value. We are all feeling different amounts, of intensi amounts and intensity of emotions. It can make being respectful challenging, especially when feeling intense anger. We all need to commit to being respectful to each other, even while feeling as intensely as we do. We may not be perfect at communicating, but if we all have the intent for respect, that will help today and moving forward. Number two, topics. Today's emphasis is on healing together. The goal of today is not political bashing, war gaming, solving the world's problems, or strategizing. Those conversations are important and need to be had. Today is not the time or space. Today is about healing or starting the healing process. You don't talk about your aunt remarrying at your uncle's funeral. Number three, use your tools. This event will feel safer if we are not all swinging hammers violently. Easier said than done, and we may need guidance or reminders, which is what the panel, the peer supports, are here to help, with, help us with. I have a three-year-old at home and I'm constantly telling her to use her fork when eating spaghetti, use her words when she's hitting her little sister, ask for help when she starts screaming. We are used to our hammers, and many of us are similar to three-year-olds when it comes to emotions. Use your tools. Some things are also meant for group discussion. Some things are better for one-on-one, -on -one, talking with a peer support specialist. Maybe better for your partner, your best friend, a fellow veteran, or a helping professional. Use your discretion for who is able to receive your message. So expectations for today, as I stated earlier, today is designed to help the healing process possibly start it. We're not done grieving the second we step out of a funeral, especially if the pain was intense. However, attending and participating in a funeral can accelerate the grieving process. Coming together with others provides us an opportunity for a powerful dose of healing that is hard to accomplish alone. That's why almost every culture, first world or third world, has rituals for birth, relationships, death, and other important events. We do our best healing together. So at this point, I wanna to transition to our panel and also to our um, guest speaker, Shelly Amon. Our panel is here to guide us in our healing and to offer perspective, their use of their tools to help us move forward. Their experiences are not yours exactly. We're not pretending to know exactly what you've been through or exactly what you're feeling. Other stories are not meant to invalidate your own, but we attempt to relate to each other and learn from past wounds and healing of those wounds. We won't have time for everyone to share all their hurt today, I encourage you to relate your own stories and pain to the wounds shared through listening. I also encourage you to use your tools through the forms of questions for those participating online, submitting those or through Dan Buttry, who's gonna walk around with a microphone. 
What have you lost? How are you feeling? Is there anything that's helped you heal? This is precisely why we have a diverse panel. Some of us are more connected to Afghanistan and may be hurting more sharply. Others have fought in other conflicts, including myself, and may have started the healing process years ago. This is not a competition of who is hurting more. We are all feeling it in our own way. Even if we didn't deploy, even if our service was short, even if we never saw Afghanistan, we might only be hurting by watching our brothers and sisters in arms in pain. And that pain is valid too. To this point, Sam, if you want to bring it up to Shelly, appreciate all your time. Thanks, Dr. Rausch. And I think uh, you really described the complex spiral of feelings and emotions that I've experienced over the last several weeks. And those that all of the soldiers I served with have called me and talked about in different pieces and in different words. Um, and that coming together is, is really is the crucial piece of this. One of the things I'd like everyone to take away from this today is look around your table. If you don't know someone who's sitting across from you, introduce yourself, get their phone number, ask them how they're doing. Some people don't have, we don't all have communities. It's something that I found early on I needed, but a lot of folks uh, might not have that. So please don't leave here without somebody's contact information, without meeting a new veteran or advocate. Um, next, uh, Dr. Uh, Shelly Aman is going to uh, uh, give a short presentation. Um, you can see her up here on the walls all around. Uh, go ahead. All right. Can you hear me okay? Can I get hands in the back if you can hear me? All right, thank you. If I lose audio, wave at me, give me a clue because I'm a little bit remote here. All right, I'm out in Connecticut, born and raised in West Dallas, went into the military when I was 18, um, 82nd Airborne Division with tours over in uh, Korea and then Iraq and Turkey uh, during the uh, humanitarian relief missions. Uh, I was a parachute rigger. We dropped a lot of parachutes to the, um, the Kurds who were leaving Iraq back in the 1991 timeframe, just to give you a little, little context. Um, went on to medical school, currently working at Yale at the VA here. I'm not presenting as a VA representative, but a fellow veteran, um, a therapist and psychiatrist who works with uh, trauma is really the heart of it. Depression, addiction, all the things related to it. Um, and just hopefully some of the stories that I've gleaned from working with veterans through the years might be helpful in our brainstorming of what to do next. So bear with me, I'm gonna put my screen up. One second. All right. All right, can you see my screen okay? All right, thank you. All right, there's me, there's me in a previous life. We're not gonna stress that, that's not what it's about. But a lot of people have questions, right? There's questions, we have more questions than answers right now. Some of the questions that we've heard lately was, was our sacrifice all for nothing? You know, certainly reminiscent of how, how things felt with Vietnam. Um, how can we move forward as a nation? Some of our reporters have asked us that, what do we do next? What do I do with all the anger? The million dollar question, right? I'm, I'm irate too, I mean, I'm feeling it. Um, is it just Vietnam all over again? Some striking images, but there are some striking differences as well. So I don't think we can just throw a blanket statement over that. And it's like trying to have a funeral when somebody's still on life support. How do we heal when we're in the middle of it? Um, like Dr. Roche said. And is it always going to feel like this? A lot of vets come to me and they say, doc, I don't think it's ever gonna change. I've tried things, I've done things. I don't think it's ever gonna be better. And I said, well, what if we could come up with a new idea? So that's what we're here for today is some new ideas that maybe, maybe a, a colleague of yours has tried, maybe a friend, a military buddy, um, a family member, something. Let's, let's put our heads together and come up with, that, come up with some ideas together. And what do we do next? I want to plan. 
our vets, our military, we're pragmatic people. We roll up our sleeves and we get the mission accomplished. We do things. I don't want you to leave today without having something in your toolbox that you can actually do today, tomorrow, when you're feeling ready, but soon. How does that sound? Sound like a plan? All right. So there's an old acronym, HUA, right? We know this term. I did not know this until recently, but this actually came from World War I radio operators. It was an acronym for heard, understood, acknowledge, HUA. Okay, we heard you, there's pain. Um, you know, thank you for telling us what you're feeling. We need to know this. Um, we need to know so that we can start to formulate what we do next with the anger, frustration, confusion, grief. This is all expected when we have trauma, when we have traumas that reoccur and re-trigger things from the past. We are feeling this with you. We are vets as well, um, or current military. Um, and you have this expertise. There is this huge amount of wisdom in this room right now, not coming from the people at the head tables or up on the screen. There's a huge amount of wisdom. You have expertise and military skills, how to deploy, teamwork, but you also are experts, maybe not formally trained experts, but certainly on the job training in pain and loss and trauma and grief. And many of you have thought about this day in and day out for years or decades. And you have some really great ideas about healing as well. So we're going to kind of dig into that a little bit today. I wanna put some names on things because sometimes people say I'm having all these feelings and I didn't know it was called anything. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of terms and one of them is moral injury. We talk a lot about injuries. We talk about TBI, we talk about physical things, amputations, but there is a moral injury. There's a cost of conducting warfare that has gone on since the beginning of time, right? Ancient Chinese, ancient Greeks, Stoics, they have written about PTSD in different language and moral injury in different language. They've called it shell shock, the thousand yard stare, battle fatigue. We have words for this. When you ask someone to go off and do things against everything they've been trained to do throughout life and go into a place of war and conduct an operation that may take life and limb and destroy property, this is something that does not go without leaving scars. We have ways to make sense of this. We have ways of putting it in the context of duty. We have ways of putting it in the context of we had to stop something worse from happening. But this is something that can hang with us and stick with us. Moral injury, there's lots of fancy definitions, but the one I like best is it's a betrayal of what's right by yourself or someone else in a high stakes situation. There can be lots of ways this happens from child abuse and rape and combat and buildings being blown up, all kinds of things, doesn't have to be military, right? But anytime it crosses what you individually feel is your moral true north, that betrayal leaves damage and can leave an effect. So that's one of the terms I'd like you to know because this is also a wound that we are dealing with, um, military or not, wherever the trauma lies, this is something that's often there. Moral injury can exist without PTSD. PTSD can exist without moral injury, but often they go hand in hand. Moral context. I can't sit here in 2021 and make Monday morning quarterback judgments on someone who was in Vietnam or someone who was in Afghanistan 10 years ago. We really have to look at events at the time as what were realistic options for what could be done and not done in the moment. We really can't say of all the things in the world that could happen, um, you know, we could have done something else. You really have to look at what was reasonable then, what was the climate then, the moral political climate at the time and think about it that way. We're pretty good at looking back later on and being pretty harsh judges of ourselves. So that's one thing we can judge ourselves pretty hardly, hard, hard pretty hard because we set pretty high standards for ourselves. And that's something that, that we often see. So maintaining what the proper moral context was for how we think about things can be helpful because we can put a lot of shame and guilt down on ourselves 
when we look at it from a different, more comfortable place in life, perhaps. Okay. Post traumatic stress disorder. Um, I don't know what everyone's background here. Some people probably know this term very well. Some people probably have a vague idea. Some people might be kind of new to the term, but I do wanna just cover some basic things. Post-traumatic stress. It kind of implies that there's a trauma, something major, and it could be minor in some ways, but has a major effect of real or perceived danger. It doesn't have to be an actual danger. It could be the fact that you thought something was going to happen and you believed that at the time. Um, it, it is something that, that is a natural, the mind's reaction is actually very, it takes natural steps in how to deal with trauma. So when we think of post-traumatic stress, I don't always think of it as disorder. I think of it as a pro-survival mechanism to keep you alive in times of danger, right? So if you're sleeping with one eye open, if you're jumping up quick, if you are scanning the room, if you are suspicious of other people's intentions, um, you know, all of those things are things that keep you alive when there's threat coming at you. So that is not anything abnormal to have those kind of responses. What happens though, is when we move out of that context into quote unquote, normal civilian life later, sometimes it goes, you know, all those things that were keeping me alive are now kind of getting in the way. Now my wife's saying I'm having nightmares every night and I'm sleeping in the other room or my mood's low, or I'm really trying to not think about these things that are setting me off. Or you know what, I don't have patience for anybody. Or I know my kids love me, but I'm having trouble feeling it because I'm feeling numb. All those things can come with PTSD. Um, and I just wanna put some names to things so that when you're going, I'm not sleeping, I'm having these weird dreams. We know that PTSD is kind of a disorder of fight or flight, right? It's, it's adrenaline, adrenaline is pumping in these times. And adrenaline can get really ramped up. It's like a faucet in the brain that kind of squirts out from a place called the locus ceruleus. There won't be a quiz, so you don't need to know that. But it's like that faucet is turned on and stays on all the time, 24 seven. It may get worse sometimes, it may get better, but there's kind of always at least a trickle going, maybe more than a trickle. You are always ready to fight the bear if the bear jumps out at you. So there is a biology to this. There is a things we can do with medications that can work for nightmares and trauma. And I'm not saying meds are the answer to everything. They are not. There's a lot, but they may have value at certain times. But one of the things we can do is find ways to turn down that adrenaline faucet, right? So that we can sleep, so that we're not feeling so short-tempered, not so irritable. So all of these things play into this, the biology of it, the fight or flight, um, the mood changes sleep issues, all these things can be a part of it. So PTSD is kind of a big thing, right? Because it has lots of parts. Um, and we can kind of address those parts in each piece as they come, come at us, right? So if irritability is a thing, we can kind of talk about what's getting there. We can talk about the heart of the issue. There are actual therapies that are based on how to do this. So there are things we know that can help. So that's one of the things I want to say about that depression. PTSD can have depression in it. Depression can have PTSD in it. It can exist separately. This can affect sleep, insomnia or oversleeping, it can affect your appetite, too little or too much. It can affect your interests and motivation. People can have thoughts about is life worth living or am I better off if I were dead. So those are thoughts that can come with depression that can come with PTSD as well. But I just want to put words on this because sometimes people think depression is just feeling sad. It is not just that. It can be irritable. It can be mainly irritable. It can be mainly poor sleep. It can be mainly poor motivation. So there's lots of things that can happen here. So I just want to, I just want to give just a little bit of information on that. Post-traumatic growth. This is something that's a little bit newer out there in the world. We, but you can actually go back to ancient Chinese writings and see it as well. When there is trauma, when there is conflict, when there is loss, 
we as humans actually have this wonderful ability to grow out of it and to become sort of bigger and better versions of ourselves. We can do this. This is something that happens. And I can say from speaking to hundreds of veterans who come to me with, with really, really striking intense stories and, and, and not, like I said, not just as adulthood, but in children as well. But the ability to grow, I've seen it. I know it can exist. I know it can happen. So this is something that we, we restructure kind of the knowledge. I think we have actually a really interesting opportunity here, especially for our, our veterans who are further along, further removed from their, their service, Vietnam vets. You have a wealth of, of expertise in what it feels like to feel betrayal and what to do with that and how to make sense of it with a little bit more distance and a little bit more wisdom, a little bit more age that really I think could be a huge value. So not only did you experience what you've experienced and really any veteran who, who has this knowledge doesn't have to be Vietnam, but you have this really wonderful ability to grow your story here. It wasn't just that, it's now what it means today and how you can actually use this from a place of wisdom. So I think that's something that we need to think of. There's a positive growth trajectory that comes out of this. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, resilience. This is a word we hear a lot of. We wanna be resilient. If I asked each of you in the room what resilience meant, you'd probably each give me a different definition. I like a pretty simple, straightforward definition. I think of basketballs on a wall. If I take a wall 10 foot high and put a bunch of basketballs on there, the first one over on the left is fully inflated. I'm assuming your image should look like mine. It's over on the left. And then the next one is a little bit less inflated. The next one's a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less till the last one is like this pancake basketball that's just sitting there all flat. And if I take a big stick and push them all off the wall, who's going to bounce back? Right? So the most inflated basketball is gonna bounce back up. And that's a really, I think a good analogy for resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back to baseline after a stressor or near baseline. So when something throws you off, like, oh, I don't know the news of the last three weeks, you have the resilience to bounce back. And that's what we wanna do. So what are things that can increase your ability to bounce back that can inflate your basketball fully? sleep, eating right, you know, when you're stressed about your finances, when you're stressed about your relationships, when you're stressed about work, all those things kind of suck away at the inflation of that basketball. So anything that can kind of keeps you, keeps you feeling like you have, I guess self-care is a word we use a lot, have good self-care, go to your doctor, get your vitamin levels checked out, all those things that we know can affect mood, and irritability and the ability to bounce back. So kind of just making sure that you have all the other ducks in a row so that when you get hit with the big one, you can bounce back. So that's what I mean by resilience. Now, one of the other things is it's easier to bounce back if you've got a network of folks hanging on to you, right? So if you feel that stress, but you have family support, you've got somebody, you know, good, good buddy that you can talk to, a brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whoever, somebody that's in your corner, they can actually kind of diffuse that stress so it doesn't all fall on you and help so that it doesn't hit you with its full impact. So that's one of the things we're doing here today is increasing that network so that when we're hit with stressors, we've got more ability to be resilient. So strategies, things that you can do. There's a good old sand table up here. So we're doing the planning session, right? Now, obviously any one of these topics we could talk about for an hour, but we're not going to, we're just gonna hit the highlights here, but I want you to know they exist. So one of the hallmarks of PTSD, avoidance and isolation. It's really, really understandable to want to avoid the triggers, the thoughts, feelings, the reminders of the things that are really awful memories. It makes sense. And when you get away from it, you don't feel so bad. But the problem is in the long term, it's not necessarily the best solution. So avoiding avoidance, maybe that's a little counterintuitive, but avoid avoidance. 
Let's try not to do that. Let, let's stay connected. Have yourself a battle buddy, a community colleague, comrade, you know, someone that you can count on. There's a lot of vet organizations that want to reach out a hand of support, friends and family, whatever that takes. Um, you actually are resilient. Everyone in the room, I am sure, has a good amount of resilience already because you have done the things that you've done in your life. But how do you keep optimal reinflation of your basketball? Well, we just talked about sleep, eat, self-care, medical checkups. Do something for you, something fun that you like to do, a hobby or something, just because, not because you earned it or deserved it, just because, and you need to put on that oxygen mask before you can help others, right? So keeping yourself in good form enables you to actually help others as best you can as well, too. You know, we all have missions when we're in the military and we sometimes lose that sense of being connected to structure when we're out. There are a lot of the community organizations, churches, employment, whatever it is, that you feel you're doing something meaningful again, that you are plugged back in to something with goals. Um, either they can come internally and just what you wanna do, or you can be in something bigger than you, the, an organization, something like that. Um, but finding a mission and a purpose again can be really, really helpful. Um, this is the community. This is the community that maintains itself. And many of these are with our own brothers and sisters who are military as well. And if not, I, anything you're interested in, we got guitar, we got horseback riding, there's all kinds of stuff out there that, that, that can be done, that can be um, fun, it could be a goal, could be some way that you can pass on some of your wisdom as well. Mental health, their talk there. There's a couple things, cognitive processing therapy, prolonged exposure therapy, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. There's lots of fancy words, but the bottom line is talk therapies can help. Medications can help. We have medications, like I said, for nightmares, irritability, mood, all kinds of things. I'm not saying it's the answer, but I'm saying it may be part of it. And I have seen people get better with that either for short term or maybe for longer term if needed. Um, peer support, the vet centers, all of these things to kind of help keep your mental health. There's a, there's a huge amount of knowledge that we do have now about PTSD, maybe different than when our Vietnam vets came home. We, we kind of know more about it and we're more understanding and accepting of the fact that this is something that we need to work on as an invisible wound of war, an invisible wound of trauma, invisible wound of childhood trauma, whatever the situation is. And you know what? there's something I want to say about regrets, because I bet you if I ask people in the room, most people would say there's there's some regrets they have, some remorse they have, some, some maybe bad feelings, anger they have about things. But anytime someone says that, the next step in my head is going, well, then you got morals, right? Then there's part of you that's good, because it's, it's actually kind of screaming out that you're working in against that, like your moral compass is 180 degrees off when you think about these regrets and you really wish it was going the other direction. Because I think everybody knows that kind of jerk that doesn't care when he hurts people or doesn't care if, if, if um, things go badly or, or he offends someone, but that is, that's not what I'm talking about. That person doesn't have remorse over the past. But everyone sitting here in this room is here because they're driven to come in and understand something, to process something, to move forward in some way. And that tells me that there is this kind of moral true north. It's all individual. You have to think about what your own means. But even though we can't do something necessarily about events that happened in the past, we can think about what those values are for us. Is it, you know, being a good son, being a good community member, um, you know, working with your job, whatever the situation is, um, there are ways to make small daily choices in alignment with that. You know, if it's call a friend, if it's, you know, try to patch things up with somebody, it's, if it's, if it's just working in a way that moves you toward which way your moral north is pointing. Those are things that we can do now, choices of, a, of daily values. It doesn't, you don't have to live with the focus on the past, but the focus forward in what that sort of highlights as the direction that you're really showing that you'd like to go in. Does that, does that make sense? 
they don't have to be big things. They can be little things, little things that move us step by step closer to who we are. I have vets who tell me, man, after 17 years, I feel more like myself than I ever have. I have vets that tell me, I have one in particular said, it feels like a 50 year old monkey climbed down off my back and went back to the jungle. So healing is possible. Now, I want you to take a second and look around the room because there's more wisdom in this room than I can do from up here on the screen. I want you to take a look at each other. I want you to think about, you know, are you at a place where you could actually reach out a hand of contact to a, a fellow vet and just to say, hey, I'm here, man, if you want to talk. Is, it, just show of hands. Does anybody feel like they could do that today? That they could just have a chat with somebody over coffee? You know, and and this is where I say, this is where you get to rewrite your, your ending, right? You get to rewrite the meaning of what this means and how you use it now. So with that, I actually wanna hand it over to Mike at the panel because I would like to open this up to thoughts and ideas and brainstorming and a little bit of um, ideas about what has worked for you. Sorry, Mike, I'm gonna put you on the spot, but what has worked for you as you are moving forward, as you left Vietnam and came back and moved forward, what have you found helpful? And then maybe we could share some ideas with each other about things that have worked for us. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I think what is most important to me is with this particular event is not to confuse my service in Vietnam with what's happening when the war ends. Uh, my service in Vietnam will always remain what it was in the integrity that it was on the battlefield with the guys that I was with. The end of the war is a completely different topic that has to be handled in a different way. Secondly, that I think the thing that I've learned is very, very important. As an infantry soldier, we're taught what to do when you're ambushed. If you don't attack the ambush and get rid of it, the chances when you run from that ambush that you'll, you'll, you won't make it are much better than if you attack it. I would say it's the same thing when we have these events. Don't run from the ambush and hide in alcohol, hide in isolation, hide in your rage, hide in your family. Attack it with the intention of resolving it. That has been one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned from the battlefield that I bring to this. And secondly, when I came home, it was about me, the veteran. I forgot about my family. I forgot that my mother was out there, my brothers, my sisters, my, my wife was out there. We have to take responsibility, in my opinion, to let them know that yes, I'm struggling, but I'm going to get help. And at the same time, I may not have the answers for you, but I'm going to help you find the resources that are available so that we can get through this as a family. Those are probably the three most important things to me. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, I think uh, we've got a pretty wide range of, of guests here. We've got Dr. Burke, who's an expert on sleep issues, sleep health. Um, uh, Jason uh, can talk about uh, the combination of both navigating uh, physical, um, physical trauma alongside um, healing emotionally, mentally, um, as well as our, our uh, psychiatrist here, um, Dr. Roosh. I'm opening this up. Would anybody, would anybody like to talk about something that question or something that some small thing that's been helpful to them in their journey? I, I have just enough gray hair to match Phil Donahue, if you remember his old program. So just show your hand, raise a hand, and I'll come over and, and bring the mic to you. We are recording, so we want to make sure you talk into the mic. Thank you. Chris. Um, one of the things that kind of helps me, well, my name is Chris Swift. I'm peer support specialist for the Captain John D. Mason program. Um, peer support, that like other things have helped a lot for me because I was talking to somebody who is like a peer. There's somebody who's been there, kind of done some things like it because you get, people get nervous when they go talk to the doctors. If I tell the doctor this, they're going to make me do this. They're going to put me in a straight jacket. They're going to put me in a padded room. It's always because as, as veterans, we catastrophize things way better than any of, any of the doctors or higher education people could ever imagine. We think it's always gonna be the worst case scenario. You know, one thing as the veteran community, we come together very well and we take care of each other. Because when you're out there, as most of you know, it's you're always worried about the guy next to you, 
the guy in front of you, the guy behind you. You're worried about everybody getting home and everybody being okay. So I think as a community in general, we do a lot of good things. But now that we have this situation going on in Afghanistan, in, a few, in about 12, 13 days, we're gonna have 9-11, the 20 year anniversary. And that's not just gonna be like, oh, 9-11, 20 years, done. It's gonna be all over the news. So all this triggering that has been going on with Afghanistan, it's gonna be two tenfold when we get up to 9-11. So please, I know people have talked about people reaching out, you know, it's not just the people that are reaching out to us. We need to reach out to them. Some people are afraid to reach out. So let's get them out of that comfort zone of just isolating and everything. And let's just be there for each other. Jason, uh, do you mind talking a little bit about how peers, um, how finding a community of peers helped you? Yeah, I, I, I think that for me, one of the weirdest things after being injured was obviously a physical alteration to my body that changed how others viewed me. And for the longest time, I would always say to myself, I'm not going to be defined by what happened to me. So whenever I'd pursue something, I used the anger that everyone has been talking about here. I used that and I channeled it into doing other things. But I had forgotten for a long time to process those other emotions. And it was until the other day that I ran into a Vietnam veteran, a brother in arms, who after I gave a speech said to me, welcome home. Because for the first time in that speech, I acknowledged those emotions of sadness, those emotions of fear, and all the things that I had buried for many years. And that wouldn't have happened had I not encountered this individual and talked to him and had that moment. And that's something that I encourage everyone in this room to do, because you know, we can deny those things are there, but it's going to kill us. All right, and I'm thankful that I've had a brother in arms, could be a sister in arms, doesn't matter, come up to me and say that, because that made the world a difference. And I encourage you all to seek that in some way, shape, or form from your veteran brothers and sisters. I do have a question back here, please. Hi, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Pierre Barucki. I'm an Afghanistan veteran as well. But I wanted to talk about the r, &R House. We're a peer-run respite um, for um, uh, veterans for the state of Wisconsin, and we operate for every veteran in Wisconsin. It doesn't matter what your discharge status is. Um, all costs are free. We also have a 24-7 um, warm line, which is 262-336-9540. And I have business cards and pamphlets up there with our information, or you can find me if you have any more questions. Um, but please, I, you know, I really, you know, everything that like Chris is saying with peer support, it's great. It's been helping me out. It helps a lot of other veterans out. Please don't be afraid to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you. I think the emphasis on network and groups and organizations that are out there, we have quite a few uh, organizations represented here. Uh, I know we have some, we're monitoring the chat as well. So folks are viewing in. Um, Bailey, just raise a hand if you've got a, got a question. Um, I'd like to, I did have one question handed to me. I'm sorry, is there somebody right um, here? We've got, I think, a veteran who just, just came back from Afghanistan. I'm, I'm interested in I'm interested in how this is all kind of, kind of landing on your lap, man. Okay, and let me just state this. We did schedule like the initial conversation from uh, 12 to one. We're going beyond that. We're not stopping at one o'clock, so you understand. We're just being respectful of those of you who maybe can only have a lunch hour availability. Uh, and then actually even beyond that, we have rooms set upstairs for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, conversations if you'd like that as well. So just to give you that reference point, this is not a hard stop at one o'clock. So please understand we're gonna keep the conversation going. Who is being uh, called out here? Okay, hey, how you doing? So my name is Brian Sikma and uh, Sam and I are actually about to become coworkers, um, work with Concerned Veterans for America, but this on, can you hear me now? Got to really talk into this thing. All right, so my name is Brian Sikma, and I uh, just got back from Afghanistan about 12 months ago, and uh, still in the uh, Wisconsin Army National Guard. And so as we kind of process what's happening today, last two weeks, right, there's uh, a lot in this room, a lot of you guys, gals went before us and your time in service has ended. And those of us who are still serving are grateful uh, for the path that you guys paved. Um, I think for those that are currently still in uniform, it's a little bit of a different process, right? Um, 
In fact, it was the uh, Iowa National Guard that was actually one of the first three battalions that flew back into Kabul to facilitate the evacuation. And so I think one thing that's helpful is for all of you who have kind of taken off the uniform for the last time, perhaps, you have experiences that are extremely useful to those that are still serving. And especially in the reserve component where you have armories spread across the state, um, you know, and drilling locations for those in the reserves, uh, there's not the same community that you'd have on active duty, right? So when we deployed, you've got that brotherhood, that sisterhood, you're there 24 seven, you do your 14 months total mobilization time between train up deployment, you come home, and then it's one week in the month, right? And we know that that's probably gets a little stressed more with COVID. There's other, uh, other mobilizations and activations that come. So my big takeaway I think would be to encourage everybody here. Uh, if you got that neighbor, you know, reach out to him. I'm lucky one of my neighbors actually was in my old unit. Um, he deployed right in front of me. Uh, he switched battalions, he deployed first, and then I went second. So we're able to support each other and to reach out to each other, but definitely use that time, use this time as a chance to interact with them and to let them know you're thinking about them. Uh, I know for me, I uh, interacted with a gentleman who's a Vietnam War veteran. Uh, it was actually the, the Sunday that Kabul, I guess, kind of fell. Um, super useful, right? Because here's somebody that had been through you know, a lot more action than what I saw on the tail end of the Afghan war. Um, but processing it with people who have been there is super important, even for those that are still serving. So I guess that's my recommendation to you. And, and on behalf of those of you interact with and say thanks. Um, just give them a thumbs up, you know, invite them over coffee, hang out with them, and uh, just be there for them because, you know, they're still ready and ready to go for the next round. Uh, but they need to know it's okay to be frustrated, right? Just because you're still putting that uniform on, you're still able to be mobilized for a disaster like we have down with the, the hurricane or anything else, that doesn't mean you should entirely suppress you know, your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, and, and processing that with somebody who's been there before is super important. Excellent, thank you, Brian. I've got to go back here to get my readers. Yes, my readers. It's a hard realization. Uh, this one was handed to me. And as I prepare to say this, I, I want to reference um, the Royal Memorial in partnership with the Medical College and Dr. Berger uh, recently secured a grant where we'll be running a statewide public service announcement, which will kick in probably about mid-September, and it's going to be focused on veteran suicide and firearm safety. And in fact, we're working with some of the creative teams here today uh, who's helping us with that program. Um, and so this was done in collaboration with the War Memorial Center as the primary partner. But the key message that's being built around that is reach out and be there. And that's a key element that the VA is taking nationally, but just, it's the same thing, uh, Dr. Amen, uh, Dr. Rausch and the panelists, and I know Dr. Burke, you've mentioned this before, it's just making yourself available to these individuals. And that's gonna be really a main theme of also then having lists and information and resources available. And this isn't just for the veteran, if I may emphasize that. And the Army used to stomp our foot right? When they're making a solid point, it's the family members, it's the loved ones. I learned that more pronounced when I was doing the Fisher House Wisconsin project. It's the families and it's the loved ones that surround that veteran who have that ability to get in. Curtis was one of our original board members on that. It's the family members and the network that help you to it. So this is also targeted towards the loved ones. This is a community of healing of what we're doing. So oh, I do want to read this, and, um, <clears throat> and maybe the panelists can respond to this. Uh, it doesn't help uh, the healing process when now our military community refers to the past 20 years as failure. Uh, we need to look at some of the positives, such as uh, no terror attacks against us. And I, I will throw this back to the panel, and please, um, it's some of the messaging that's out there that's probably not helping. <laughs> um, with this, I think there's a lot of confusion, but any, would anybody like to address that? Looks like Dr. Raymond has her hand up, so please. I do, so this is actually what I'm thinking of. I'm calling it the project, the Vietnam projection. We're taking Vietnam, we're projecting it forward into Afghanistan and saying, just like that, we're gonna write this off. But I wanna stress, even though there've been these striking images comparing the Saigon evacuation and things like that, I wanna really stress something that's quite different about this and why I don't view it as a failure. Um, the Afghan people have had 20 years of, it's a generation 
that has been raised under a different context of a different idea of what freedom is, of a different idea of what women can do, different idea of what a government looks like. And we can't really sit here at this moment in time and know what the future is going to show of the trajectory that they will take it in. Now they have a responsibility here to kind of run with the ball. Um, we certainly want to do what we need to do to keep folks alive. Um, but I don't think we could pass that judgment and look at this and say it's the same or it's a failure. It is maybe the operation, maybe the extraction we could call you know, certain elements failures. But I think overall, it has given an entire generation a different meaning. And I think that's really, really important. This, this is one of the issues that I that I've probably been talking about the most since um, over the last few weeks as Afghanistan has kind of gone pear shaped. Um, it's critical that we seize this opportunity with this conflict to demand that the talking heads, um, politicians, military leaders separate these different conversations. Um, the general foreign policy, military strategic planning um, is separate from the execution of this withdrawal from Afghanistan over the last two weeks, which is both of those are separate from the individual service and sacrifice of every man and woman who put on the uniform and went over there um, to do their job and to bring more Americans home safely. And I think that's something that, that didn't happen in past conflicts where these were all conflated as one political talking point. And it's so crucial that we separate those conversations so that we can have them constructively and productively without adding harm to the veteran community, which is exactly what that has done historically. I'd just like, I'd just like to add to that. You know, as human beings, we like to think that we can just make meaning of our own life and purpose just by ourselves. But other people's opinions matter, whether we want to or not. I got a lot of kids at home, and when they bump their head, they look at me. When they color a picture, they look at me. Did I do good? Did I do bad? And so exactly what you're saying in this question is when we get messages that what you did was a failure, it impacts us. I mean, it does. Now, we can try to minimize that with techniques and talking your battles on your left and right, but it does. And I think you're, you know, right, like that, it takes a toll. It's like a body blow after body blow. And we have to acknowledge that we're taking those body blows and we got to do something about it, right? Because it does have impact. I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads there. <laughs> um, Chaplain. I fought in I want y'all to kind of look around the room right now. What is missing in this room right now? Where are all the men of color, the black Vietnam veterans? I fought and right now we have a lot of Vietnam veterans that I hear in the streets. They're still fighting the war in Vietnam because out here on these streets, it's a war zone. It's a spiritual war. I fought in, fought with the Third Marine Division, one man, the walking dead. I was a K-son. For 40 years, I didn't talk about Vietnam. I've been out here in the streets. I've been walking for the last seven years walking the streets, trying to deal with the violence that's going on within the inner city. On the 14th of this month, I was on my way home. And all of a sudden, the spirit of me says, you'll be 72 on the 15th. So why don't you stop off and 
have yourself a good time. You've been out here in the streets. You've been dealing with all the violence that's been going on here at Milwaukee. And so I'm right now in front of that, and I stop at this bar called Mr. J's on front of that. And so I go in and I'm waiting for 12 o'clock to come because I want, on, on, at 12 o'clock, I'm gonna turn 72. So I get in the bar and I'm in there and I'm waiting for 12 o'clock to come and all of a sudden the DJ announces 12 o'clock and I get up and I'm dancing, I'm enjoying myself, I'm having a good time. All of a sudden the young lady that I'm dancing with turns and runs. So I turn around and I look and I see I'm escorting somebody out of the, out of the bar. Then all of a sudden, at the back of the bar, another altercation started, and then they rushed somebody out the side door. And within a few seconds, all of a sudden, I hear somebody say, they're shooting outside. And when they said that the door jammed, so I had to wait for the door to clear before I could step outside. As I stepped outside, I seen the, the police guard and I'm also a retired Milwaukee police officer. I did 25 years in the Milwaukee Police Department. As I step outside, I see a squad, so I started walking toward the squad. As I look to my left, on the sidewalk, it's a gentleman on the sidewalk, and the police is doing CPR on him. As I started walking over there, it's looking, when I seen the blood, all of a sudden, I had a flashback. And all of a sudden, I started feeling evil all around me. So now I'm, I'm I feel an enemy. I don't, I don't, I feel enemy all around me. And so I had to get out of there. So I, I went home and about five o'clock before I could go to sleep. And then I went to church and when I came home, I turned on the TV. I didn't see Afghanistan, I see Saigon. I've seen the same thing. And so now I'm, that walking dead side of me, that killer side of me is starting to, 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 to act up. And then they said somebody got, three people got killed while a car hit a, hit a bus and then a guy driving down 76th Street uh, hit, uh, killed two people. So I'm sitting there and, and, and I'm just going down further and further. Then the police officer shoots someone and I go over there. At first, I didn't want to go because I, I, I had got in that mode where I didn't want to be around nobody. I, 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 because I was in that mode where if you say the wrong thing to me, I was going to do something to you. I was. I, I was in that killer mode. I was in that killer mode. And so I went over where the police officer got shot and, and, and uh, had shot and killed again. And the whole time I was out there, I was just, I was feeling evil all, 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 all around me. Finally, by Friday, I was in uh, such a, this mode where I hadn't came out of the house. I didn't want to be around nobody. I, I started cussing. I walked to the store and I was walking back up the street and I was just cussing, just cussing. And one of my neighbors, she says, why are you cussing? And I, and I made a statement about everybody cussing. I just went on inside the house. I didn't want to have no conversation. So finally on Friday, I went to, uh, to out to the vet center and I talked to OC out at the, at the vet center. And, and that helped me a whole lot. Then I went back Tuesday of last week and I had another conversation with me. And right now, Donald, one of these people is going to help the Vietnam veterans, and even the Vietnam veterans can help the Afghanistan vets. But the only person that can help a Vietnam veteran is another Vietnam veteran that's already been through it. <laughs> It'd be like this a woman could sit down and tell a man what it's like all day long, what it's like to have a baby and they may have been able to comprehend. If you ain't been in war, you haven't fought in war, you haven't fought in a war, you ain't gonna be, that person ain't gonna be able to relate to what you're talking about. They're not, they're not, they're not. I shared some things with him 
there's a lot of, God is, there's a spiritual war going on in this America. We went and fought the man's war. It's now time for us to fight that spiritual war. It is, it's time for us to fight that, that spiritual war. And for a lot of vets, for a lot of Vietnam veterans, they're not gonna, they're not coming. You can go up up all types of centers and everything else, but I'm telling you that, they're not coming. You're gonna have to go out there and find them. We're going, we don't have to go out there and find them. It's like Jesus went out. They, you can't build a place and wait for them to come to you. You got to go to them because they, 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 they're not coming. I'm telling you right now, they're not coming because they're still living in a, a war zone. At nighttime, I live on 61st and Capitol. Sometimes two or three o'clock in the morning, I, I think I'm back in Vietnam. Pop, pop, I'm hearing gunshots, you know. And this what's going on with a lot of people that's living in the inner city. They, they're living in a war zone, living in a war zone. I woke up this morning and hear about a man Hammer the 12, our children. The children and our babies and our women are dying in this city. I want to acknowledge you sharing your pain with us and your story. And I know, you know, as a vet and working with vets, I know a lot of people want to work with me because I'm a veteran. And there's not enough veterans to help every veteran. You know, professional help, right? Um, Shelly talked about heard, understood, acknowledged. We hear you. We may not understand what you've been through all the way. We're trying. Um, your pain is real. I think you bring up a really good point. We have a wound, right? So you have old wounds and you have new wounds. And when we have new wounds on top of old wounds, they get real deep. And I think that's what's happening with Afghanistan right now. It happens in the inner city. It happens when we experience pain. And one of the things I say is this healing stuff is hard if we're in a vacuum, if life just kind of pauses around us. But that's not how life works. We're healing through more death, another day of news, another incident, you know? And that's what makes this stuff tough. And I think that's why a lot of times we need a guide, we need a battle buddy, we need a partner to help with that. Because when we're alone at the bar, right, we are vulnerable. We're very vulnerable at that moment. So I appreciate your story. Um, and I hope others can hear you and understand you more as you recover. And Chaplain is... What is going on with a lot of vets? They haven't got that out of them. What they did in Vietnam, a lot of them still feeling guilty. I was feeling guilty for a long time because I was with an outfit that we was, we was killers. There was a bounty out on us. You can tell you, there was a bounty. They wanted us dead. And on March 27th of 1968, when we came out of that perimeter of uh, Kesa, this is when they almost, uh, I got hit three times with the AK-47. I spent 13 months in the hospital. I spent six months in a cast that came off the hill and went down there. For nine months, for nine months, every four hours, I was getting morphine. So, you know, and so, for 40 years, from 1968 to 2008, I didn't talk about Vietnam. I didn't, I, I didn't want to, you know, I, I stayed busy all the time. And this thing, I stayed busy so much that I didn't have time to think. When you out, you think a lot. And a lot of this stuff starts coming back to you. So a lot of guys are feeling guilty about what they've done. And then for somebody to come up and you, you try to talk to someone that's never been in war, and then for them to say, oh, I've never done that, that just, this just drives you down further. And I, and I, I oh, go ahead. One last thought, Dan. Um, the phrase, time heals all wounds, I don't like that because this is exhibit A. 40 years, time didn't do shit. Um, time is helpful to heal, but it's not the only thing. I see Mike Corbin nodding his head there, fellow Vietnam vet. We have a, we have a number of Vietnam veterans in here as well. I just want to make sure um, when Mike... And, and Greg reached out to me four weeks ago. This was before the, the, you know, the, the significant collapse of what was going on in Afghanistan. Mike called me and said, we're hearing through the vet centers, they're getting calls from around Wisconsin from Afghanistan veterans saying, this is an issue. And so we started talking about doing, trying to do something like this 
And we were talking about, you know, maybe mid-September, let's get through 9-11. Well, when everything took a sudden turn on the ground, uh, mission dictated what we needed to do, right? Those of us military types, situation changes it. And so that's why we, we, we reacted quickly. But the interesting thing was it was Mike and what I'm hearing with Chaplain here and other, the other Vietnam vets who are in the room here, they're saying, we've lived this, we've done this already. But here's the thing, and Dr. Amen, this is, goes back to your point of resilience, um, getting that mission, having that mission. And that's what I love about this. It's the connection generational, Vietnam, Afghanistan, GWAT, that's so important because it's also, if it's helping you, it's helping us. It's helping the community. It's a positive step forward. And, and I think the question that we had that was on um, in the uh, chat section, which it references the um, is celebrate recovery through a local church. And of course, not all healing is done, meaning no offense, Dr. Rush, <laughs> Dr. Amen, right? You guys do an incredible service, but also faith uh, in, in other channels. And I think that's part of what you're seeing here. Uh, I heard this morning, by the way, um, one of the main groups that's been established by Fort McCoy, which is where the Wisconsin refugees are going, it's through uh, Catholic Charities out of, out of La Crosse. So my understanding is they are the designated NGO that's currently working with uh, the command at Fort McCoy and that group. So again, here you go, another faith organization is doing that as well. So does it, any, the panel, would you like to remark on this? and? And, um, and, and so it'd be a combination of the faith organizations and the collaboration and part of the healing. So go ahead. You know, I, I think one thing is that uh, there are so many different groups that touch on different activities and communities um, that could be tailored to, uh, that are tailored to the things that veterans or an individual might already be interested in. Uh, the, path to, the path to healing for me was an accident I had to take an art credit at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, uh, and I ran into uh, Jim Tass, a Vietnam era corpsman um, who ran, uh, did theater classes and was part of a uh, theater group uh, for veterans that helps veterans, uh, they put on Shakespeare's military plays and they tie in your story into Shakespeare's military plays so that other veterans in the group help tell your story for you. And for me, that was the thing. And I don't really like theater very much. I don't care about art. And, but that was the thing. That was the thing that I was able to say something out loud through a group that I had never said out loud in 10 years. And so it, it, it could be any number of these different things. You know, there's art, there's uh, equine, there's lifting and fishing and um, rucking groups. It, any of these things. There are so many amazing things out there, um, it, but it's important to try them. And sometimes we might sit back and be like, oh, it's art, that's, that's weird. I don't wanna to touch that. But it's just, it's worth trying these things to find these tools that will help us individually break through some of these barriers. The, uh, the group you're referring to, I think is Feast of Crispian, is that yes. correct? Um, we're actually going to be working with them for the PSAs for the statewide uh, campaign we're going to do because they're, they're veterans who have gone through and struggling with PTSD, and they're actually going to be part of our, um, our talent that we'll be working with. So again, you can see here is the collaboration, the groups working together, but also if they can do Shakespeare on stage, we're not going to give them a lot of lines, but we know they can hit the marks on camera and do a 15 second ad because uh, it's, it's an awesome, uh, awesome. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to share um, one thing that I didn't see on the table and that I want to encourage people to think about as a mechanism to help with trauma. Um, and in particular, gardening is what some people call it. Agriculture is what some people call it. But whatever it's called, <laughs> the concept of growing and putting your hands in the soil, or maybe not even in the soil if it's hydroponics, um, but it is a huge, huge benefit for dealing with trauma. And there's a lot of opportunity for veterans and the intersection with agriculture. And it is very much all of the things that you do, which is serve, it can help with food insecurity in community with food pantries. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I've heard such great 
um, stories about how it has been um, transformational in people's lives. And so I just want to share that um, as I leave out. God bless you all. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I know we have some equine therapy here too. Do you, I mean, anything for the, for the good of the cause? Of course. And rugby, by the way. So that's the other thing is the team um, panel, right? What do we lose when we leave the military? It's our teamwork. It's the, it's the camaraderie. And um, I think you do, you do some great work. I know you do some great work in both, both areas. So. Howdy y'all, my name is Ben Singleton. Um, yes, I'm using a, a variety of strategies to help me maintain my uh, mental state right now from the vet center to equine therapy to healing warrior hearts. Um, some of the gentlemen right here are, are from my rugby club veteran and uh, just having those little conversations like that are the strategies we all know and we've outlined and it's helps you to, to maintain uh, that path that, you know, eating and sleeping and drinking is easy, but the uh, practice is what's hard. And so I'm utilizing my peer groups to help me with my practice. Um, that being said, that's how I'm fighting through this, this, you know, this ambush right now. Um, what I'm concerned with is we're coming through an ambush. And as Chris uh, touched on, we're going into a pitch battle with 9-11. And I'm racking my brain on new things we can do, new strategies, how we can touch people that maybe uh, we're, we're trying to get people to start. There might be guys that are ready to start now and how we find those guys. Um, I have a concept and I have anybody wants to talk to me about it afterwards. I'd really appreciate it. And cause I could use the feedback of this community, but I'd like to do something the morning of uh, the 12th to support any veteran that might be in crisis that night that they know they have something to do in the morning. We can reach out and find that individual that morning. Um, this is just a rough idea and I appreciate all uh, context. Also, if anybody is interested in equine therapy, you can talk to any of us and, uh, We'd love to tell you about it. The thing about working with a horse is uh, it's not a cat or a dog. It's a, it's a prey animal. So they have to learn to trust you. It's a big animal and you can't kick it. It'll kick back. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I grew up on a hobby farm. I'm doing air quotes because if you put hobby and farm together, that just means you do a lot of work and don't get paid to do it. Um, but we had horses. <laughs> Never heard that one, huh? <laughs> um, but we had, we ate great, we, we can. But my sisters all had horses and they put me on one once and it bucked me off onto the barbed wire that was down below. And I think I was 10 or 12, but um, you, something you said, and it's actually gonna be in my remarks this month, September for our 9-11 reference. I met Gordon Haberman a few weeks back. Uh, he's from Kewaskam. Um, if you know that name, his daughter was in the Twin Towers. It was her first day on the job and she was calling her fiance when the plane hit. And Gordon said, as a, as a recovering father, it's about 9-12 when they ask him as a, as a grieving dad, um, because it's, it's what you do now, what's ahead, and what, what, what legacy do you carry? And I think, panel, if you could reference this, and I'm, I'm sorry, I get a little emotional, <laughs> um, surprise. It's what are you going to do? What, and I'm going to challenge everybody here. I know I'm only supposed to be done, uh, Phil Donahue right now, but I mean, we're recording this. We want to make sure we get this out to other groups so they can see this is just an idea of what we're, we, what we are trying to do. Um, is it going to be perfect and, and solve all the world's problems? Probably not. But I tell you what, we're trying. Essayance and the engineers, let us try. If you've never heard that, that's the Army Corps of Engineer motto, Essayance. Just let us try, let us, let, let us just try to make a difference. And I think I'm seeing it in the room here and what you're doing with equine and- I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, I wanted to say this earlier. I'm not suicidal at this moment, but I know where that lives in my head. And I know where I could be on the 11th and I know what booze can do to me. And I, you know, I think we all know that nasty feeling. And yeah, I'm afraid going into it myself. And that's, that's something else I wanted to say that, yeah, it happens to me too, and I'm not afraid to admit it. It's, it's powerful stuff. And Dan, I'm just going to 
check you, do not apologize for getting emotional in an emotional moment. Um, that's what the hell we're here for. Yeah, when, when a dad is looking you in the eye and telling you that, and you go, wow, that's strength. Yeah, and I think just when you're talking about the routes of healing, and you know, as a psychologist, I'm supposed to corner the market and have everybody come to my office. I don't have enough time to see everybody, all right? I need the planting, the equine, the peer supports, the spirituality. There is no competitive market for healing. There is a wide amount of things. So don't think you're doing it wrong when you do feeds, feeds of Crispian or anything like that. Find, plant seeds and let one of them take hold. I mean, that is what you gotta do. I see Dr. Man had her hand up as well. Yeah, I, I just have a, a flurry of things going on in my head right now. One of them is my great grandmother said, when the troubles of the day are mounting, put your hands in the soil. So gardening also is something that I enjoy. And I know a lot of people do get that. So that is very valuable advice that you heard from our friend here today. To our chaplain um, who shared these really heartfelt um, comments about his, his world and experiences. I want to say, first and foremost, it may be an imperfect home, but welcome home. The gentleman who told me the 50-year-old monkey climbed down off his back and went to the jungle was an 87-year-old Vietnam veteran. And he had nightmares every night for 50 years. And after we did some work together, he was in a different place. And he said, Doc, I didn't want to come back to my appointment because I don't want to talk about this stuff but I haven't had a nightmare except for twice in the last month, which is different than the rest of my life since Vietnam. Something is working. So there is hope. It is not fair and equal for everyone. And there are people really, really struggling. And, you know, I'll be, I'll share here too. Today is the birthday of my Green Beret fiance, third group 18 Bravo service in Tunisia and Haiti who died in a plane crash. So that is one of the things I'm, I'm feeling today and part of my mission, one is to, to say this is kind of, I'm doing this in honor of him, but another thing is, is to say my mission is that there you are right, chaplain, there are people still in the jungle and there are people still in the desert and they are walking around amongst us and it is our job to welcome them home and let them know that they can start their life here again. So to the panel, and again, we're not cutting this off at any point. We want to continue this, but we are at coming up on uh, 1.30 Central Time. And so we want to make sure that we're being respectful for everybody's time. I guess I'd like to throw to the panel just a, because um, you're all dealing with this, right? From each of your own perspective. Um, what's your next step forward? Uh, thank you, Dan. I think one of the most important things in my experience was this whole thing of stigma. I've listened to Jason, I've listened to Sam, I've listened to so many people. This stigma is created by people that have never been to war. And we wear this for so long. My father is World War II, my brother's a paratrooper. I'm not gonna show the world that I have any weakness, any cracks that I have not with up, upheld my responsibilities as a man or a soldier. And it's the biggest line of crap I've ever learned in my life and I fell for it. If we stop and think as infantry, so whatever your MOS was, could we have gone to war and seen and done these things and not have these responses? That's what's always gotten to me. And because we have these responses, we in the community understand them. And that's where we can come together and do one of the most important jobs that I think we have to do. And that's get rid of these goddamn stigmas. Sorry, chaplain for the military language. <laughs> yeah, John. On here, John. We're recording, so we got to get you on the mic. I'm a Vietnam vet, and I know some of the Vietnam vets here, so I'm talking on a big thing. We walked around, and we came home, and we didn't talk to people because people didn't want to talk to us. We were, we were not treated very well by our country, but I'm going to throw this out to the Iraq Afghanistan vets, one of the things that validated us was the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. The day that thing went up, we became good veterans again. And so you guys start thinking about it. I know there's a lot of pain and healing. But down the road, 
We've got a Vietnam Memorial out here. You've got space for you guys. It gives you a sense of purpose and mission and it's duty, honor, and country. You can honor those people that have served and died there and you can honor your service. So please, please think about doing that once we get over this immediate thing. Yes. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Um, and I, I appreciate from the bottom of my heart, every single thing that we have, all these tools that we have, the GWAT generation, we have because you guys and gals fought for them so that we wouldn't have to go through what you went through. Um, and I think sometimes that gets lost. So it's always important for me personally to bring that up. Um, I, I appreciate all the opportunities that I have because of what you guys went through and what you did to fix these problems. Um, I, there is a global war on terror memorial in DC. It's in the planning phase. Um, we have a Congressman, uh, Mike Alger, who's a Marine Corps Iraq vet who's been a part of that uh, process, has kind of been on the front end of that. Um, it's been a weird challenge because this conflict has gone on for so long and doesn't really have a definitive end date because it's in so many places. So, um, uh, but I, I appreciate that. I think that the, the memorialization is, is so crucial. Uh, for me, one of the, I don't wanna, no, not, I don't wanna call it that, but, I've never been back to Fort Lewis to visit my unit's memorial uh, for my first deployment. And that's like a milestone <clears throat> that I'm aiming for in my healing process is to get back there and see that, that the city built for us after I left. Awesome. Thank you. For those not on the mic, there's uh, in Marcel, Illinois. Marseilles, Illinois. Uh, also, if you go to the high ground in Nielsville, which is one of our five stops that we're recommending for a road trip in Wisconsin, they have a Persian Gulf desert storm and recent Iraq, and it's actually formed in the shape of a boot, um, like as if we stepped in with our, our desert boots, and it's pretty powerful. I was there and, and I took a number of photos. So it's actually at the high ground up in Nielsville. Now it's not to the level of the official national, but uh, that's that's worth a visit as well. It's it's a few hours north of here, but it's it's worth a trip. Fall colors. Back to the panel. Yeah, Dan, I just want to go back to the question you asked the panel, like what are we doing moving forward? And I think it's one, get a new mission or multiple missions, right? So husband, father, veteran, you know, part of building a program at Aurora, you know, having a new mission, but Sometimes when we have a new mission, we don't feel for 40 years. So it's having a mission to give you a sense of purpose and feeling along the way. It's a key and not a but. Um, so one of my passions is to help others, help vets, fills my tank. And I, one of the things that I do almost any time that I do a speaking engagement is talk about veteran and what it means to be a veteran. A lot of us have deployed, some of us haven't. You know, and what we have typically been bad at through generations is to piss on each other. You know, like we're in a, we're in a pissing match, we're in a competition, you know, the World War I to the World War II vets, the World War II vets to Vietnam and so forth. How can we expect civilians to treat us with respect when we don't do it to each other? You know, so to really honor that anybody who has ever put on the uniform and raised the right hand is a veteran. And then our stories are very different from that point. I think I can get to this reference without getting too choked up. When I came home on leave for just after the holidays and I came to Mitchell, the Vietnam vets were lined up. It was the last flight into Milwaukee. There were hardly anybody in the airport, but the Vietnam vets were there because they'd heard their vets. Because they said never again. Yeah, those Vietnam vets to me, I, you know, I, I can't thank them enough. And the reason for me saying that is because I am the recipient of so much care and attention that was brought forth by people who advocated for that after the war. I would not have had the treatment. I would not have had the, the, the help or the resources or any of that had it not been for the tireless advocacy of those who had came before me in this area. So, you know, as we're talking about getting new missions and new things like that, you know, we'll all find different paths on that. And 
no matter what, if we apply it to the principles that we believe are the moral good, um, something great can come out of it. And I, I'm, I'm a recipient of that. And so I always say thanks to every single Vietnam veteran I ever meet because I literally wouldn't be standing without them. Speaking of which, I believe a Vietnam veteran. Hi, uh, I heard the chaplain say he's, uh, you are at K Son, and I was a Vietnam combat veteran 69 and 70, and uh, I decided to go back in 1999, and I've made 52 trips back to Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And we started building these libraries, and we built one at Khe San. And I think if you went to Khe San now, and we had a lunch with the VC and NVA that we fought, you would be, you would find you got the welcome home you never got in the US by going back to Vietnam 25 or 30 years later. That leads me to the other thing you just mentioned. Um, when I was in college, a, a professor said to me something that has always stuck with me. Uh, and that is, this is the success story that I believe Afghan is going to be. I don't think you lost any war, and I don't think you lost the mission. I do think you inspired change in a positive way in the nation of Afghanistan that Russia never accomplished and the uh, other countries throughout history with the freedom of ideas and the world of children and women being uh, uh, brought into society. And all of that change is not going to change. The Taliban can do what they can do, but they're not going to change that. And the, uh, this saying was, uh, once the mind of man has been stretched by an idea, it never resumes its original shape. And you guys have accomplished that. There is, should be some sense of accomplishment, but it's going to take time for that to unfold. And in Vietnam, to us, remember, North Vietnam was a dark black hole. Where is that? And now we're embraced, and I don't know that the dynamic is the same in Afghanistan, but the change you have invoked by your mere presence over 20 years, the Taliban cannot reverse that, and it will not happen. 50 years from now when I'm dead and gone, and you're talking to somebody, you'll look back, and I believe that you have changed Afghanistan for the better, despite all the pain. Thank you so much. And, and again, thank you everyone for, for coming out today. I, I hope you've taken something good away. Uh, make sure if you've got a new neighbor at your table that you take their name and, uh, and their contact information away so we can continue to grow our communities and be supportive. I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Dr. Shelley here to, to wrap this up and um, thanks again. Thank you, everybody. I just want to say what's uh, helped me with resuming uh, what mission I have and Dr. Birick, Dr. Rausch. Um, we teach military culture to the healthcare providers so that when you go to the facilities like the VA or any other hospital that has, that works with vets, they're everywhere, right? So it's any hospital, they're able to better um, work with the veteran and and be respectful and and understand at least in a small bit some of the things that could be helpful. So that's one of the things I find is my my mission now. I think it's so important to distinguish the war from the warrior. We can have our opinions about the war, but it does not reduce the honor of the warrior. That honor, that loyalty, fidelity, these may be catchphrases, these may be on flags and banners, but these are very, very real for us. Um, and we feel them deeply. So, so hang on to that. Um, I want to just end with saying this is, this is tough stuff. This is difficult conversation. Um, some of you may feel this when you leave today. Some of you may feel a little keyed up, a little bit flared up. Um, what we want to avoid is, is, is folks leaving here and feeling like they're right in the midst of it again or having a flashback and things like that. I want to take just a moment here at the end. I'm going to share something with my screen. Um,
Sorry, let me get to the last slide here. Sorry. And Dr. Raymond, while you're bringing that up, uh, there was one question that came in on the chat. It, it talked about the civilians. So what, what can civilians do? If you could just touch on that as well. I think you could get bring us some Sure. Good. Sure. So uh, thank you for your service, right? So this is your, something we hear all the time. Um, I talk about this with the residents in the hospital, the staff in the hospital. When you say thank you for your service, I'm going to tell you something. If it's genuine, the vets will feel it. They'll feel the genuineness of, of that sentiment. Um, that's a complicated sentiment. Thank you for your service actually comes out as a pendulum swinging from, from Vietnam, from the things that, that, that we didn't do for our Vietnam vets and the guilt that our community, our nation feels over that. And it has risen up in this thing that um, of reaching out a hand saying, thank you. But I'm gonna tell you if, if, it's, if it's not done with sincerity, if you don't really believe it, if you're saying, thank you, it wasn't me. Thank you, it wasn't my kid. Um, it's, it's gonna be felt because vets are also pretty good at sniffing out things that aren't true. So I would say, if you're going to reach out, reach out with sincerity. If you say thank you for your service, do it from a place that's really in your heart. If you don't feel it, say something else. Say thanks for coming. Have a great day. Glad to meet you. Love to talk to you some more. Something else. But um, realizing that when someone doesn't show up, it isn't necessarily due to lack of interest. It may be because they're having a really hard day getting out of getting out of the house. I actually kind of affectionately call the VA the big box of triggers, right? Because nobody wants to get up and go to the big box of triggers and think about stuff they don't want to think about. So it's hard to get there. If someone doesn't show, give them a call. Say, hey, how you doing? Are you okay today? Let's try again. So not giving up on folks whose knee jerk may be to avoid and retreat back into themselves to stay safe. So that's one thing I would say about the community. Don't have to push people but certainly being there, um, being welcoming, being sincere, everybody that or not, military or not, every human being has a story and having gen genuine curiosity and supporting, hearing their story and helping where you can and asking, is there something I could do to help today is a really good question too. Okay. So the last thing I wanna do is just say, this is, this is difficult stuff we're talking about. So I want to just show you, I want to demonstrate two things that you can take with you. This is part of your toolbox. Now you got your hammer, you got all these other tools, whatever else you have, and you're going to have this too. So it sounds simple. It sounds a little fluffy. Believe me, I'm not all touchy feely, but, but what I do want you to do is I want you to just feel that, you know what, we're probably pretty tense right now because this is tense stuff to talk about. So I want you to just do a little deep breathing. The reason behind this is when we have fight or flight, the opposite of fight or flight is rest and digest. The two systems in the human body cannot operate simultaneously. So we can kind of bring ourselves down from fight or flight into the more rest, digest, calm mode by doing some things. One of them is to focus on our breathing and slow it down using our belly muscles. So I'm gonna show you this. You can do this anytime, anywhere, any place. Nobody needs to know you're doing it. Usually takes about 10 breaths in and out. So what you do is a four count breath through the nose, a four count hold, and a four count pushing out open mouth with the diaphragm, with the belly muscles. If you're having any breathing trouble, short of breath, feeling dizzy, you can certainly just reduce that to what you're comfortable with. But I'm gonna show you, and I'd like you to do this for about five big breaths with me. So in through the nose, one, two, three, four, a hold, two, three, four, and out through the mouth, two, three, four. And I want you to just do that a few more times. One, two, three, four, hold, two, three, four, and out with the muscles. Okay, a couple more times. I'm just gonna be silent and let you do that. If you do that about 10 times or so, you can bring your physiology down. So that's one thing I want you to try. Maybe try it later today. Try it when you have a quiet moment. Try it if you're feeling a little stressed. 
The other thing I want you to do is something called grounding. Grounding is bad if you're a C141. Grounding is good if you have lots of trauma memories and reactivity. So this is something I would like you to do because some of us may feel like our minds are spinning and going to a lot of other places that we remember right now. So what I want to do is kind of bring us back into our own bodies and our sense of here and now. So what I want you to do is just, you can close your eyes or leave them open, whatever you're comfortable with. But I want you to feel where your body is touching your chair, the back of your legs, your back, your arms. I want you to feel if the chair feels hard or soft. I want you to feel your feet on the ground. I want you to feel your clothes touching your body. We forget about that after a while, but feel your clothes. Okay, if you're wearing glasses or they on your face. I want you to feel the temperature of the air in the room. Okay. I want you to listen. I want you to hear the sounds that you hear in the room. Okay. And with that, I want you to come back into now, into your body here and now. Take another big breath. Okay. And with that, we're going to go to our, our next step. We're gonna, we're gonna finish the formal part of this and I'm gonna hand it back over to Dan and uh, lead us to, to what the next things are we can do. All right, hey, thank you everyone for coming out. Um, there will still be space available if anyone wants to stay, stand by and uh, have a, additional conversations about any of these topics. Uh, we really appreciate you guys coming out today.